Okay, good morning, everybody. We are continuing with the review of the third chapter of Tractate Megillah. We're up to Chav Chav Dalad Ahmed Aleph 24a. We're holding about halfway down by the Mishnah. So the Mishnah had said, the Mishnah says that um, with regards to reading the Haftorah, right, the one who reads the Haftorah, he's given the honor to go and then uh, lead the congregation um, as of, as the Shliach Tibur to repeat the Shemona Esrei. And uh, if he's a Kohen, he gets to do the Brichat Kohenim. He lifts his he lifts his hand. And if he was a minor, so therefore he cannot do any of those things. He cannot lead the congregation for the Amidah. He does not go up alone to, uh, to bless the people if he's a Kohen. So then we give that honor to either his father or his teacher to go up and to lead the congregation on his behalf. It seems to be that in those days, reading the Haftorah was hard work. And leading the congregation was considered a big honor. So they decided if you put in the hard work, we'll give you the honor, right? If you, if you put in the hard work to read the Haftorah for everybody, then we will give you the special honor of leading the congregation. So now the, the Mishnah continues. When we're speaking about uh, somebody under the bar mitzvah, a cotton, a, a, a minor, right? So he can read the Torah for the congregation and he can translate for them. However, he cannot do what we call pores ala shema, divide the shema, where we explain that what this means is for the people who, who already prayed at home, but when they came to shul, when they came to the synagogue, they missed um, baruch hu, um, etc. So they're allowed to uh, they're allowed to, if they have 10 people in the congregation, one person goes down and it's what's called dividing the Shema. He says, Kaddish, Baruch Hu, and he says the first blessing on the Shema. So this minor is not able to do that. And he's not able to go uh, before the Ark, meaning he's not able to lead the congregation with the repetition of the Amidah. And likewise, the Mishnah says, he's not able to lift his hands to bless the people if he's a Kohen. Um, today, the custom is that Children can go up together with their fathers if they're at an age where they're being trained uh, to do the mitzvah of birchas kayanim. However, um, the custom is that a child, if he is the only Kohen, wouldn't go up by himself to bless the people. It's only if he's going up with another adult. Okay, now, um, the Mishnah continues and tells us that somebody who's, whose legs are exposed or as Tesis explains, it's talking about somebody who's wearing tattered clo clothing, then he can he can go up and divide the Shema, which means to say, do that, um, saying Kaddish and Baruch and just reading the first blessing of the Shema for those who came late. And he can serve as a translator. However, due to the way he's dressed, uh, it's disrespectful for him to go up and read for the Torah from the Torah for the congregation or lead the people with the repetition of the Amidah. Likewise, he cannot go up to bless the people. The Mishnah continues and says that a blind man, right, he can divide the Shema and serve as a translator. Now that seems to be a Chidush, right? Why? Because he's, he's going to be saying the first blessing of the one who Yitzhak Hamayir is the creator of the of the, the the luminaries, and here if he's blind, how can he be making that blessing? But nevertheless, the Mishnah seems to say that he can. Rabbi Yehuda is of the opinion that somebody who has never been able to see the luminaries uh, ever, meaning he was born blind, then he would not divide the Shema um, and make that first blessing of Yitzhak Hamayir. That is the end of the Mishnah. Is that clear? The Mishnah is okay? All right. It says the Gemara. The Gemara says like this, with God, so the first ruling that we said. That the I have a question. Yep. Um, if we back up one. What's, is it Poteach uh, or is it Pochet? Poes, it is Shema. Pocheach. It's called Pocheach. Pocheach? Okay. Yeah, Pocheach. It's, uh, it's not a very common word. Pocheach. I mean, somebody I who, whose legs are exposed. Yep. Uh, 
So R- Rashi Rashi explains that uh, it's it's somebody who's like wearing shorts. So do we apply that now? Um, <laughs> ask your local Orthodox rabbi. Um, some synagogues are particular about it. Some are not. Um, I guess you know there are different halachas with regards to sniut modesty and certain uh, things such as um, having your feet uncovered, uh, depending on where you live and which climate you live, uh, the custom of the people is different. And so in a place where the custom is that most normal people cover their feet, um, you know, out of respect for others. So then one one would come into shul and one would need to cover their feet. Um, other people, other places where um, people do not cover their feet, um, so people are not so particular about it. Yes? Um, I I wanted to say, I think it's for the covet of the Torah that he shouldn't read the Torah, not just the people. That's, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, but again, it, it's you, we're trying to be respectful in a manner that is commonly viewed as respectful. It, the people are the ones who I have, I guess, as a society, um, decided what is mo- what is modest and what is not. Okay. Anyway, um, moving on to the Gemara. So the question we have is as follows: We said in our Mishnah that somebody who reads Navi he gets all these special honors, right, of like splitting the Shema. And he's able to lead the congregation with the repetition of the Amidah, etc. So the question is, why? Why? So Rav Papa says it's because we want to give him an honor as a compensation for having agreed to read from the Haftorah. Rav Shimi, Rav Bar Shimi says a different reason is because otherwise he'd come to quarrel with the person who led the prayers. Why? Because it seems in those days... Um, the person who would go down and lead the congregation got paid for his job. So now, if we wouldn't give um, this person who reads the Torah the honor of going to lead the congregation, he would come and start getting upset with the guy who's leading the congregation. Why is this guy getting paid and I'm not getting paid? So the Gemara asks, okay, we have Rav Papa's opinion and we have Rabba Bashimi's opinion. What's the practical difference between the two opinions? The bottom line is, um, either way, we give we give him the, these honors. So the answer is, the difference between them would be, what happens if the guy who generally leads the congregation, right, in the prayers, um, doesn't get paid? If he does things for free, in that case, one wouldn't be obligated uh, or need to give um, the person who he's after these special honors. The only time you would have to give them the honors if the guy was getting paid. That would be the practical difference. Whereas Rav Papa would say that no, since it's an honor to the person who has read it, and that's compensation for the reading, that's going to apply all the time. It's nothing to do with keeping the peace. Okay. Um, says the Gemara, we've learned in a Mishnah, right, in, in our Mishnah, that if the guy who went up to lead the Torah was a child, his father and his teacher would get it on his behalf. So now the Gemara tries to analyze. Let's take Rav Papa's view and Rabba Bar Shimi's view, right? And then try and apply it over in this case. If you're going to say that the reason why we are affording the father or the teacher the honor of leading the congregation after the child had led the congregation for the Haftorah, if you're going to say it's that there shouldn't be a fight, um, you, is a child really um, one who quarrels that you have to give to his father or his, or his teacher the honor so that he doesn't get into a fight with the guy who's leading the congregation? That doesn't make sense. So rather, what do you have to say? You have to say that um, it's got to be because of the honor. Now, if you're going to say it's for the honor, really, a child really cares about his honor? That's only for adults. <laughs> it's only for adults to get to get all upset when they didn't get the appropriate respect, right? 
So the Gemara says, rather, what we have to say, in order to resolve this, we say that it's not for the child's honor, but the honor of his father and the honor of his teacher. Uh, that's what the sages were concerned about. Uh, they would be upset that here this child um, went and exerted himself to to lead the congregation with the Haftorah, and the father and the teacher didn't receive um, in his place uh, the, uh, the, the um, compensation, so to speak, for his efforts by giving them the honor. And that's what we're worried about, right? We're, so the, we're worried about um, the the potential of quarreling for all the father and the teacher um, in the case where the child gets the, gets the aliyah. Okay, that's in that. We said that in the Mishnah that somebody whose, whose legs are exposed, he can go and split the Shema. Right? But he cannot read from the Torah for the congregation. So the Gemara asks, Ula Barav asked Abaya, what about a child? Is a child who's wearing shorts, who's, who's, whose legs are exposed, can he read the Torah for the congregation? His mother dressed him up in shorts to come to shul, and can he go up and read from the Torah? So Abaya asks him, you know, Jewish, Jewish people always answer questions with a question, right? So Abaya says to him, let me, uh, you should be really asking, right? You should be really asking, what about a minor who is naked, right? Is he allowed to read from the Torah? Why aren't you asking me that question? Well, the reason why you're not asking me that question is because you know the answer. What's the answer? Uh, even if it's a child, he cannot read naked. Why? Because of the concern of honoring the congregation. Well, so too over here, it's not honoring the congregation if you let him to go up and read it in shorts. And therefore, that's the answer to your question. It's not just adults. Even minors are not allowed to um, go up and read from the Torah if they're wearing shorts. Okay. The Mishnah said that a blind man can divide the Shema, which means he can say the blessing, of, the first blessing of the blessing over the luminaries that God has created in the, in, in the heavens, right? So the Gemara says, that there's a, a, a brisa in which the, the sages said to Rabbi Yehuda, many people have sought to expound in the Merkava, although they've never seen it. And so, since it's possible to comprehend something without ever having seen it, so therefore, one who's born blind should be permitted to be able to say the blessings um, of Yitz, the blessing of Yitzhak Iris. And therefore, they should be allowed to divide the Shema, even though He's never had direct benefit from uh, from these luminaries. So the Gemara um, offers Rabbi Huda's response. Rabbi Huda will say to you that over there, regarding expounding the Merkava, the Merkava, which is the first chapter of Yecheskel, which talks about we learned a little bit about the Merkava in in uh, in tractate Agiga, right? with what was on there, the different angels, the different faces, and so on and so forth. All of that are spiritual concepts that the heart can understand, right? The, and the mind can understand. So these are things that are dependent on the understanding of the mind. So therefore, a person is able to concentrate and know it even without having seen it. But here, when we make a blessing over the Shema, right? Meaning the blessing of the luminaries, that is thanking God for the benefit that one's had from it. And since a blind man has no direct benefit from it, you can't compare the two, right? And therefore, it's different to understanding the Merkava, even though you've never seen it. Here, it's not about the blind man being able to imagine uh, what it is that he's thanking God for. Here, the blessing has to be um, thank you, thanking God for the benefit, but he hasn't received benefit. Really? So what about the rabbis? And the rabbis are the one who say that you still make the blessing, that the blind man can go up and lead the congregation in the, the splitting of the Shema, uh, of the, yeah, Paris al Shema, uh, dividing the Shema, which means saying the first blessing uh, before the Shema. Why? Because they teach, uh, they teach him, they teach like Rabbi Yossi taught. What does Rabbi Yossi teach? So there's a Bryson that says, Rabbi Yossi said an interesting story. He says, all my days, I was very pained over the fact that I didn't understand a verse in the Torah. It says, in, it says 
this is in the curses, that you will grope at noonday as the blind man gropes in darkness. Now, let me ask you a question. What difference does it make between the darkness and light to a blind man? In other words, when you talk to me about a blind man groping around, does it matter whether it's in the noon or does it matter whether it's at night? Either way, being blind is a terrible thing. But yet the Torah goes out of its way to tell us that with, with, that, that we will grope at noonday like the man who gropes in the darkness. What does that come to teach me? So he says, I didn't understand it. And it bothered me until one day there was, I had an incident and this is what happened. And this is how I then began to understand <clears throat> the meaning of the verse. What happened? I was walking in the darkness of the nighttime and I saw a blind person who was walking on the road and he had a torch in his hand. And so I said to him, uh, my dear son, what do you need uh, this torch for? Because you're blind. It says you're blind. Um, so what's it, what's it going to help you to have a torch? You know, Mamela, and me, I walk around with a torch. It's because I, 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 I can see. But you can't see. So what's the point of walking around with a torch? So he said that as long as the torch is in my hands, people will see me. And since people will see me, then they will save me from harming myself in the ditches, the thorns, right? And so therefore, <clears throat> the, uh, Rabbi Yossi thus interpreted the verse as a blind man gropes in utter darkness where no one can see and or help him. So since a blind man does get help and benefit from the light, so therefore they can make the blessing over the, the first blessing of the Shema, which is the blessing of the luminaries, sun, the moon, etc. Okay, so that's the end of this Gemara. Moving on to the next uh, Mishnah. Um, we're halfway down on 24b. So the Mishnah said, says that a Koyan whose hands are blemished, he cannot go up to bless the people. Uh, what's the reason? Well, we'll see. The, the, the Mishnah will give the reason at the end. The Behuda says, somebody, even a kind whose hands are stained with a type of dye, right? He cannot raise his hands and bless the people. What's the reason? The reason is because people will stare at him. And this is not good for uh, a person to look at the hands of the Kayanim because when the Kayanim go up to bless the Jewish people, the Shekhinah rests on their hands and therefore it is not good for you to look at and gaze at the hands of a of a Kayan during Wichas Kayanim. That's the reason why we cover our heads with a talus and the Kayanim also covered their heads with a talus. But in a time when they didn't do that, where the Kayanim just lifted up their hands, so then it would be a problem to look at the hands of a Kayan. That's why we say that a Kayan whose hands are blemished because it might draw attention and therefore he shouldn't he shouldn't go up to bless. Okay. Really? Then, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, if they have a mum also, they're not allowed to go up either. I mean, a Kohen, they got a wound on their face or on, on their, it's not just their hands. Am I correct? I mean, it, it, but that, what, that the Gemara is going to state that, yes. The Gemara is going to say, yeah. So, so it's taught in the Brisa that it's right over here. The Brisa, the Brisa says, uh, the Brisa says that the blemishes that they said disqualify a Kayan from blessing the people are the blemishes that are found on his face, his hands, and his feet, um, because uh, the Kayan would go up barefoot to bless the to bless the people. Right? They would also have their faces uncovered and they would have their hands uncovered. And so, those, since those are the three places where everybody can see. So that's going to draw attention, and that's why if you have a blemish in any of these areas, one is not supposed to go up as and bless the people. Now, you have to understand that also, although a Kayan who has a moon is not allowed to work in the base of Mikdash, it doesn't mean that he's not allowed to bless the, uh, bless the people. Even somebody who has a blemish is allowed to bless the people so long as that blemish is not a revealed blemish, um, that is going to cause uh, and draw attention to himself when he gives, when he blesses the people, because that's going to cause people to look at him. So now Rabbi Shulman Levi said, 
if a person's hands are spotted, he should not raise his hands and bless the people. And we have a brisa that 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 teaches the same thing that somebody with spotted hands cannot raise his hands to bless the people. If his hands are bent forward or bent to the side, he cannot raise his hands to bless the people because again, he's going to draw attention and people are going to look, and they shouldn't. Nowadays, this is not really a problem because everybody covers their face with a talus. So they're not looking at the kernel. And the kernel themselves are covering their faces. Okay, so now, Rav Asi says, right, that a kayan who comes from the region of Haifa or Beishan, they're not allowed to bless the people. Not because of any blemishes that they have, but um, because of a... Uh, an impediment in their in their speaking. They're not able to uh, articulate um, the differences between an aleph and an ayin. And we'll see there's another brysa that says similarly that these people are not allowed to go down and lead the, pre the prayers in front of everybody else if they are from these places, right? Why? Because they call, that they read, they pronounce the aleph as an ayin. Now, what's going to happen if you exchange an aleph for an ayin? So, for example, in the birchat kanim, right, in the priestly blessing, you say, Yo'er Hashem, panav elecha, Hashem should shine his countenance upon you, right, or towards you. So now, Yo'er means to shine, but Yo'er with an ayin means to arouse, like to arouse anger. And so, therefore, um, that's not what we want to be saying to the people. That's why we say, if your coin comes from this place where they are confused, the olive with an iron, they should not go up to bless the people because you'll end up saying something very different, which is not a good thing. Reb Chia, here's a story where Reb Chia said to Reb Shimon, the son of Rebbe, if you were a levy, he says to him, if you were a levy, you would be disqualified from standing on the platform. In other words, Levim, in the time of the Beis Amigdash, they would go up and they would sing together with the with, while the kernim were doing the avayda. The kernim would sing. Now, if somebody had a very thick voice, he was not able to go up to the platform. So Reb Chia tells Reb Shimon Barabi that if you were a lady, you would be disqualified from going up because your because of your voice. So when he came home, right when Reb Shimon Barabi came home. He told his father what had happened, right? So, Rebbe said to Rebbe Shimon, you, you can go and say to Rebbe Chia <laughs> that when you reach the verse that says, and I waited and I will hope to Hashem, are you not going to be a blasphemer? Why? Because Rebbe Chia used to pronounce a ches as a hey. He couldn't say the ch. He would always say the, he would say huh. Now, what's the difference between Hikisi and Hikisi. Hikisi means I hit, <laughs> I smite Hashem, right? Yeah. Rabbi, you froze. Rabbi, you froze. Yes. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Right. You froze at uh, when you were doing the explanation of vehikiti and vehikiti. Right. Okay. So when it comes to when it comes to vehikisi, that means that I will hope to Hashem. Hikisi means I will hit, and so that's kind of blasphemy. Blasphemy, and so um, that's what Rebbe told his son to go back and say to Rebbe Now this this whole story is hard to understand. I don't have a good explanation. Um, I don't have any explanation, um, but if somebody wants to think of an explanation, that would be great. And here you have a story where you're talking about great, great rabbis, where one rabbi would just say to another rabbi, right, that, you know, if you had, if you were a lady, you'd be disqualified or from, from, from singing because your voice is so, so thick. And then the next, the next part of the story is even more difficult to understand. That he went home and he went and he told his father the story. Isn't that Lashon Hara? I mean, what, go back and tell your father what happened. That's Lashon Hara. And then the father goes and tells him to go back to the rabbi and to give the rabbi 
a different insult. I mean, so what's really going on over here? Um, I'm not sure. Um, the best I can I, I can offer is to say that there is this principle that Torah he velumud anitorich. It's Torah, and since it's Torah, I need to I need to study it. I need to understand it, and therefore, even though sometimes it's harsh on the ears, um, nevertheless, there's something um of great value that is being uh communicated here between Reb Chia and Reb Shimon, and it seems that Reb Shimon didn't understand it, and so he came to his father not to tell him Lashon Hara. He came to his father to say, I didn't understand what my teacher was trying to teach me, right? So what he said, was, so what the father said is, go back and tell him that he struggles between the Ches and a Hey, right? And somehow this uh, enigmatic uh, <laughs> conversation is supposed to have um, enlightened the his son, Reb Shimon Barabi, when he would have gone back to Reb Chia, Reb Chia would have explained to him, um, you know, the whole conversation. You know, it reminds me. Question. Yep. Question. Yeah. He said, if you were a Levi, does it, was he a Levi? No, he wasn't. But, so but the, why would you the, say that? So the the point that he's trying to make was that, okay, you have, you have a husky voice. Okay. okay. So that if you were this kind of an individual this would be a puzzle and and the, the father is replying is basically saying we all have our own foibles so you know why make a big deal about it because if we all did we'd all be puzzled to to stand in front of Hashem and and speak to him and 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 ask for forgiveness and everything else so therefore you know it's it, it, it just you know, uh, you know, work through it and and don't say anything to anybody else. Uh, you deal with your own um, lack lacking items, and we deal with own our own lacking items, and and that's it. You know, Hashem forgives; otherwise, nobody would be forgiven. Right. Now, I, I I hear what you're saying. Um, I'm just looking over here in the art scroll, and it says that if you want to understand. The enigmatic exchange between Reb Chia and Reb Shimon and Rebbe, you should see the Chassam Seifet and neither 49b. So, um, if I uh, find this Sefer when I go to Shul later, maybe I'll get, I'll look it up and and see see what he says. Okay, moving on to with uh, the Gemara. The Gemara says that Reb Huna said that a guy who has um, a problem with his eyes, which means he's constantly tearing. He also should not go up to lead uh, with with the uh, birchas kainim. Should not go up to bless the people um, for the same for the same problem for the same idea. So now the Gemara says, um, Rav Huna's ruling is that a person like that should not go up. But we have a, a testimony that there was a certain kohen in Rav Huna's neighborhood, and he would go up and he would bless the people, even though. Rav Huna was there, and Rav Huna did not object. The Gemara answers that um, since that guy was very familiar in the city, nobody would pay attention to the fact that his that he was, uh, you know, that his eyes were tearing all the time because they were so used to it. We only uh, have our attention drawn to things that uh, we're not used to. So somebody who, you know, uh, you know, every, every talk we, we spoke a bit a minute ago about people having defects, right? When you come to a community, right, and you see somebody with a defect, it all, all of a sudden stands out to you. You look around and you see nobody else has a problem. Everybody else just seems to be ignoring it. And the reason is because they're used to it. So this is the same, same principle. When, 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 some, when you're used to something, then it's not a problem. That's why I was not to go up and do the Birch Hatzkanim. Now, um, the, the Gemara says also that there's a Brisa that says, right, that a kind whose eyes flow with tears cannot go up to bless the people, but if he is a familiar figure in the city, then he's permitted. So we have a story and a brisa to support this idea. So now another disqualification, says Rabbi Echanan, is if somebody is blind in one of his eyes, then he's not allowed to bless the people. Um, Rabbi, yes. I, I'm thinking it, there is a difference between hearing something and seeing something. So when 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 your voice is wrong, 
it's it's difficult to listen to but that's true. but if you have something visible you don't have to look there that's okay but here okay. you cannot avo not avoid it okay I, 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 and i'm saying why 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 are you mentioning that why are you saying that because that's why the child father was wrong that he said go and tell him something else you know I because know. The guy told him your voice is, you know, difficult to listen to. Right. Many right. times in shul, you'll see people that don't speak Hebrew or whatever and try to sing, and it's difficult to listen to them. <laughs> That's true. That is true. Okay, Shkaya. So the Gemara, the Gemara says another, another, another disqualification. Rabbi Yechon said that somebody who is blind in one of his eyes, certainly if he's blind in both of his eyes, he should not go up and bless the people. Again, for the same idea. So the Gemara says, but there was a certain Kayan in Rabbi Yechidon's neighborhood. And he would go up and he would bless the people, even though he was blind and no one objected. The Gemara gives the same answer. that He was somebody who was familiar. Everybody knew him. So therefore, they were not going to look at him. And there's a Brisa that says exactly like this. That what? That somebody who is a Kayan that is blind in one of his eyes cannot raise his hands. But if he was uh, somebody that's familiar in the city, then he could go up and he can um, he can bless the people. Okay, so then the Gemara continues with the final part of the Mishnah, which said that Rabbi Yehuda says that a Kayan whose hands are stained cannot raise his hands. Uh, it was told in the Brisa that if the occupation of most of the people in the city was to uh, paint or something that would ha cause them to have their hands dirty be, uh, with dye or something of that nature, it would still be permissible then for a Kayan to go up and uh, and bless the people because it's not an unusual sight. Everybody's hands would be stained, and so therefore it, no one would look at the Kayan um, just because he has stains on his hand. There's the, the principle of Lifnei Iver Lesitin Michel, that in front of a blind man you should not place a stumbling block. And because looking at the hands of a Kayan is a, is a very uh, severe thing, therefore you don't want to be the one who's responsible from, for causing other people to look at your hands. And that's why it's forbidden to go up to bless the people if your uh, hands or your blemishes or whatever it might be is going to be the cause of causing other people to stumble. Okay. Moving on to the next Mishnah. Says Rabbi, the Mishnah. Yes. You know, there's a story in the, in the Gemara in which they talk about you know uh, whether a tanner can actually be allowed to go and daven in a in a shul, but if you're part of a group of tanners and you have a shul, you know you all have the same kind of smell, so you're used to the smell, so it doesn't appear to be anything special. That's so, correct. I mean, this this basically follows the same idea. If you have a place, absolutely, the majority of the people are. You know, our painters and their and their hands are spotted or whatever it is. You know, that is correct. Is. That's correct. I think I think we had that. that we had a um uh, in in this Gemara in Megillah when when we were speaking about when we were speaking about selling synagogues, right? <clears throat> so we spoke about somebody <clears throat> who they had their own synagogue because of the smell of the uh, of the the profession, and uh, so they 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 had their own synagogue because of that. You're right. Right. Yes. Okay, says the Mishnah. Somebody who says that I don't want to go up to lead the congregation for the repetition of the Amidah in colored clothing, then our response to that is not to allow him to go even if he's wearing white clothing. And this is be to do with, um, well, the Gemara is going to explain why, but the, it's, it's, it's to do with respect that he might be a heretic, um, as we'll, the Gemara will discuss. Um, if he says, I'm not going to go out down, to lead the congregation with uh, wearing sandals, so then he shouldn't go even barefoot, okay? For the same reason. Now, somebody who makes his tefillin on his head round, right? Then it, it's a sakana. It's actually endangering himself, and there's no mitzvah accomplished by wearing it. Now, what does that mean? It means that when a person has round tefillin where the bottom is round, if he were to um, bow down, for example, when it comes to the tachnum, then it could push 
into his head and it's very dangerous. And so therefore, we say that it's a sakana and you don't fulfill any mitzvah if you have tefillin that are round. Now, what happens if you take the tefillin and you put it um, on your forehead, which means right over here, between your eyes and your forehead, instead of up here where we usually put it, right? Or if you put it on the palm of your hand instead of on the muscle where we put it, so then says the Mishnah, this is the way of heresy. Now, what happens if somebody says, you know, I just won the lottery and I want to honor God, so I'm going to take my tefillin and I'm going to cover it with gold. So, or if you took the tefillin, the arm tefillin, and he says, I'm going to put it on top of my sleeve instead of directly on my bicep. So this is the way of the outsider. What does it mean, the outsider? These are the people who follow their own judgments even when the opinions are outside of the way things were um, prescribed by the Torah and by the Chachamim. And that's not a good thing. So therefore, the best way to serve Hashem is by doing what you're told. When you're told, this is how we do things, you do it that way. Now, obviously, if you can buy a more Mahuda uh, Talis, or you can buy a nice Esri. This is a way to honor Hashem, but we're not talking about um, taking a more expensive fruit in the place of an Esri. Say, oh, I spent more money and I got an I got a nice dragon fruit, <laughs> or whatever it might be. Right? That's not how it works. You do what you're told. This is how we do it. That's how we do it. Okay. Rabbi, I have yeah. In in the line before, so if the guy basically says, "In in in wearing sandals, I don't want to," you know, daven. Yeah. He says, Even if he is barefooted, I I thought you were not allowed to daven barefoot. Well, um, because that's an indication of avilut. No, well, it, it 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 depends. I mean, the the kayanim would work in the base amigdosh barefoot, right? The kayanim would go up. Um, and 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 they would bless the people barefoot. Um, so be, being barefoot isn't always a sign of avilut. It is also a sign of avilut today when we have uh, when we when we all walk around in shoes. But uh, it could be it could be that in those days um, people didn't always walk around with sandals. Um, it says I I'm trying to remember where where it says this, but it says somewhere in the Talmud, if I'm not mistaken that there were people who, when it comes to walking um, in a regular street, um, they would uh, they would walk without sandals. But if they were walking in a place where there was water, they would put on sandals because there they couldn't see what they're stepping on. But in a place where, they're, where they could see where they're stepping on, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't wear sandals because they could be careful on their own to just walk on uh, flat ground and not step on anything. So what we see from there is that um, walking barefoot in those days wasn't necessarily considered avilut. Um, I heard an interesting idea with regards to wearing a sandal and not wearing it with avilut. There's uh, a word. Sa saving it from wearing it out. Oh, so it says, so when it says when the Hebrew word na'al, right? Na'al is a, is a, is a shoe, right? So na'al is but you're freezing. You froze again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. You froze before. Okay. Right. right when so, you started your your explanation. Right. So, so mm -hmm. the, 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 no. now the word now is a Russian tavis for nachash upper lachmai that the the for the snake it eats from the dust of the ground. Right. So the idea is like this that um because of Adam Marisha's sin, right, we, he brought death into the world. And so that's like the curse of the ground that was, that was, that was brought about through uh, Adam Marisha's um, sin. And so the reason why we would wear a shoe, right, of sorts, is to separate us from the ground so that we shouldn't be affected by the sin of other Marisha, but when somebody passes away, you've just been touched by the 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 the, the effects of the sin of other Marisha, and therefore you take off your shoes um, and you come straight into contact with with the ground um, 
Well, anyway, that's that's something that I once heard. Anyway, uh, question. Yep. I understand what you're saying about the Kohanim, but I don't think it applies in this particular case. That's what I'm saying. They're talking about to go before the before the the teva to be to be mitpalel. So, so I'm saying that it, 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 back in the day, in the time of the Gemara, it seems that it wasn't so uncommon for people to walk barefoot. That's what I'm saying. Yes, Ben. Yeah, I, are you talking about walking in front of the Torah or, or talk, the Birkat Kohanim? Uh, we're talking about leading the congregation. Barefoot. Leading the congregation. So can can somebody with with uh, sandals lead the nation, the congregation? Yeah, so we're saying no, yes. No, we're saying we're saying that if somebody is saying, I will only go to lead the congregation if I'm wearing something, or if I'm not wearing something, when you're particular in that regard, where the rabbis don't say anything about it, right? Yeah. Then we're worried that it's due to uh apicursus, uh, heresy. Um I think that that, there, that there's some discussion about the way the Christians would uh would be particular about what they wore and what they didn't wear. And so we were worried that if somebody came along and he said that I'm not going to go wearing this kind of clothes, I have to wear that kind of clothes, or I don't want to wear sandals. Um, I, I, you know, I want to, um, I will not go to, um, with sandals, right? So then we say, we're worried that this guy is a, 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 a apicurus, is a, is a heretic. And since we're worried about a heretic, even if, right, the situation is that he walks in and he's wearing, and he's not wearing any sandals, and he doesn't say anything. We're not going to let him lead uh, lead the congregation anyway. Not because he's not wearing sandals, but because of what he said prior that he said that he doesn't want to go while he's wearing sandals. That's the point, Rabbi. Rabbi? Yeah. Okay. When when the Kohanim do him and they go yeah. up to the yeah. uh, okay, they take before they they take their shoes off and and. Mm -hmm. uh, they, and they're washing, then they go up and they do them. Now, isn't isn't actually taking off one's shoes a sign of mourning? I mean, I, you and know, it, so why would this be so that's prevalent? What we're discussing. Yeah, so no, it, it, it really it really depends why you're taking it taking the shoes off. I mean, <laughs> for example, I mean, different I, circumstances. There are different circumstances. That's not correct. All right. So the circumstances over here where you're taking them off is just like Moshe Rabbeinu was told to take off his shoes. Before he came to a holy place, so so too the Kohanim, the Beis Hamikdash, when they went up to the Duchan to 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 bless the people. So because of the holiness, they took off they took off their shoes, and because we're trying to reenact that when we go up and bless the people, so therefore we also take off our shoes, right? Um, but it, it so taking off your shoes isn't always a sign of mourning. Okay, I see. Okay, okay, thank you. The Mishnah says, "What's the reason why we don't uh, we don't allow him to go up?" It says because we're worried that that he perhaps he had heretical ideas. Um, that's and that's why he refused to go up wearing certain clothes. Now, we said that somebody who makes his tefillin round, it's a sakana, it's a danger, and there's no mitzvah. So the Gemara wants to say that maybe this is a support for that which is taught. We learned. Um, uh, by the rabbis in a brisa, where they say that tefillin have to be square, right? That's a halacha the Moshe Misinai. That's something which was received by Moshe at Har Sinai. That tefillin <laughs> have to be square, although it doesn't say explicitly in the Torah that they have to be square. This is part of the oral tradition, the oral law that Moshe received at Har Sinai. So Rav says. Right, explaining that price, and Rava said that in their stitchings and in the diagonal, <clears throat> they have to be exactly square. So let us say that our Mishnah is a support to that price, right? When our Mishnah says that you cannot wear round tefillin, isn't it supporting this idea that Moshe Rabbeinu received the tradition that it has to be uh, that it has to be um, square? So Rav Papa says that no. Um, our mission doesn't necessarily imply that tefillin have to be square, although it is the halacha, right? Halacha la Moshe Mishina, that has to be square, but you cannot use our Mishnah as that support because the case of our Mishnah could be um, when the tefillin was made round like a nut or an egg. And so therefore, no inference can be made from the Mishnah to support 
um, the brysa that it has to be exactly square. You know, it's not that we're denying that the tefillah needs to be square. The, it's just that our Mishnah wasn't telling us that the tefillah has to be square. Our, tefillin, our Mishnah was telling us that it is dangerous to have a round bottom on your, uh, uh, when your tefillin, that when your tefillin ha are round at the bottom because of it pressing into your head, which is dangerous. Okay. We're up to the next Mishnah at the bottom of um, 24b. Ha'ayme, somebody who says that what? That good men shall bless you, right? What does that mean? That means that a person is saying, right, that it's only the good people who should praise Hashem. And, um, you know, and it doesn't include the wicked people. So the Mishnah is telling us that this is the way of heresy. This is the way of heresy, right? When somebody says may uh, that Hashem should have mercy um, on us as his mercy extends to the bird's nest. We know we had a Parshki say not long ago that Hashem tells the Jewish people that when you want to take away the eggs from the mother's nest, you have to send away the mother bird first. So that shows compassion. So we're saying, just like you show your, your mercy extends to the bird's nest, Hashem should have mercy on us. Or if he says, for your goodness, for good, for your goodness is your name remembered, right? For your goodness is, is, is your name remembered. Or if somebody says, him twice, we give thanks, we give thanks. In all of these instances, we silence him because we're concerned that this is blasphemy. This is somebody uh, that is that 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 is is uh, speaking heresy. So now, the Mishnah says the next ruling that somebody who gives a euphemistic interpretation, right, to the forbidden unions, right, we silence him because he's coming along and he's trying to um, say that the forbidden unions are not really forbidden, but rather. He's explaining it um, as as a parable, as a as a euphemism, right? Now, if somebody says, "And of your children, you shall not give over to Melech," and he says, "What this means is, you should not give over your seed to impregnate an Aramean woman who is going to bear a child for idol worship." Also, we silence him with condemnation because he is coming along and he is uh, he's distorting the literal meaning of the verse and. He's thus assigning a kares penalty to somebody who has relations with an Aramean woman when, in fact, there is no such kares um, penalty for somebody who marries an Aramean woman. Although it's forbid forbidden, it's not, uh, it's not uh, punishable by kares. So therefore, we silence him. You know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, when we look at the sin of Adam and Chava, Right? What happened? What happened was, Adam was told by Hashem, do not eat from the tree. And Adam went along and told Chava, don't touch the tree. Uh, no, so, so, no, sorry. She, Adam went and told Chava not to eat from the tree. Chava, when she came along, and, and when, the, when the snake asked, why not eat from the tree? She said, because we're not allowed to touch the tree. And by adding... She ultimately ended up subtracting. By adding to the rule, she ended up taking away. And so therefore, we have a rule in the Torah that you're not allowed to add and you're not allowed, not allowed to subtract from the Torah. And that's why somebody comes along trying to be helpful, right? But by adding to the to the Torah, he's not actually helping. He's making problems. So that's why we silence him with condemnation. Okay, so that's the Mishnah. The Gemara comes along, comes along and looks at the second ruling of the Mishnah. When we said that somebody says, maidim, maidim, right? He says, we give thanks, we give thanks, we silence him. Why do we silence him? Because it makes sense, because it sounds as if he's accepting that there are two deities, one after the other, right? And when one says, for your goodness is your name remembered, it's also understandable why we silence him. Why? Because his statement implies that for the good things, I'm going to praise Hashem, but for the bad things, I'm not going to praise Hashem, right? Hashem should not be remembered for the bad things that have happened in the world. And we learned it, where we learned in the Mishnah that a person has to 
bless Hashem for the good, just for the bad, in the same way that he managed, that he blesses Hashem for the for the good, right? In other words, in other words, although there are two different blessings that we make for um, something good that happens and something bad that happens. So, for example, if somebody wins a big fortune, they say Hateva Ametiv, right? Or they make a Shech Yanu, but Hateva Ametiv, if it's for, if you're not the only person benefiting, but Shech Yanu, if you're the only one benefiting, right? And for somebody passing away, you say Baruch Daina Ames. So, although there are different blessings, but we have to bless Hashem in both circumstances, whether it's bad or whether it's good, we have to bless Hashem, we have to thank Hashem, in other words, you have to make a blessing and praise Hashem, right, despite it not being uh, always revealed good, right, so when a person comes along and says that it's for your goodness, your name should be remembered, it could sound like he's saying we're not going to uh, praise Hashem for, uh, for the bad, so therefore it's understandable in both of these cases why we silence him, but what's wrong with the guy who said have mercy now, on us, like you have mercy to the bird's nest, right? To the mother, to the mother bird. What's what's wrong with with what he said, and why are we silencing him, right? What did he do wrong? The Gemara answers that the, this is a matter of dispute between two rabbis in Eretz Yisrael, right? And that was Rabbi Yisi Bar Avin and Rabbi Yisi Bar Zvida. What did they say? One says that the reason why we stop him and we silence him is because he instills jealousy in the works of creation. Which means to say, Hashem only has mercy on the mother bird, but doesn't have mercy on the other animals. And so therefore, we say, it's better not to say anything about that. This is a, the, a decree that Hashem said that we have to send away the mother bird. And, uh, but it's not about Hashem's compassion for the mother bird, because if you were to say that, then it would cause jealousy amongst the other uh, the other animals in the animal kingdom. But the other one says that that's not the reason. The reason why we silence him is because he renders the mitzvahs of Hashem into acts of mercy. In other words, when you come along and you attribute um, the motive of a mitzvah to uh, just mercy, then what you're doing is you're disrespecting the mitzvah because the truth of the matter is what is a mitzvah? A mitzvah is a commandment from Hashem. It's a decree from Hashem that we do because Hashem says so, not because of how it makes us feel, not because it lines up with our own personal values and our own personal feelings, but rather because of what Hashem tells us to do. And therefore, to come along and say that Hashem should have mercy on us, um, in, 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 like he has mercy um, on the mother bird, right? You are disrespecting the mitzvahs by um, by chalking up the the mitzvah to just an act of mercy of Hashem. So we have a story that a certain man went down to the lead the congregation, and he said in his prayers, "You Hashem have shown mercy on the bird's nest. Similarly, you should have com compassion and mercy on us," which is exactly what we said we usually can't stop people with. And then he goes on to say that you, Hashem, have shown mercy on an animal and its offspring, forbidding us to slaughter the, the, the child and its parent on the same day. You should have compassion and mercy on us. So Rabbah said about this person, right, how well this sage knows to win favor with Hashem, which seems uh, striking. Why would Rabbah say something when we know that we are supposed to stop this guy, right? This is not a good thing that he's done. And Rabba tells his students that uh, this is, well, look at this guy. What a way to, he knows that he knows how to win favor with Hashem. So Abaya says, but don't we say that you're supposed to be quiet? You're supposed to silence him? So Kamara says, Rabba, right, who was aware of this Mishnah, right? He only wanted to sharpen Abaya. And that's why what he tried to do is uh, to um, elicit a, 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 a sharp response from Abaya, right, by saying the opposite, by saying that, oh, what a good thing this guy did so that Abaya should come back and say, no, it's a terrible thing. And so that way he would sharpen Abaya. Interesting, <laughs> interesting story. Okay. You understand the story? Yeah. That he, 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 
he went about saying something that he didn't believe in order to be able to get Abaya worked up and and and, and sharpen his mind. Okay. So the, the Gemara relates another similar incident. You know, it just, I just so I don't know, a story just jumped, but popped into my mind, right? Um, there was a time where the printing press was uh, a very expensive ordeal, right? In order to be able to print things, you'd have to spend a lot of money. So there were a lot of books of Torah that were written with typos, with mistakes, right? And so when somebody would be learning from the mistake, right, they would have to sit there and they would have to really work hard to try and figure out whether they're not understanding or it's just a typo. It's just a typing mistake, right? So when the when when they came out with one of the books of the Torah, right, one of the like like commentaries, it was actually a, a book of Hasidus, right? And they they, they came and they and they took this uh, book of Hasidus and they went through the book and they tried to correct all the errors and they printed it a new a new print which corrected a lot of this, the mistakes one of the great uh rabbis of the, of that generation was very upset why is he very upset he said the reason why i'm upset is because until now people had to work really hard to make sure that they understood the content well so that if they were to determine that it's a printing mistake right they really had to exert themselves to be sure of it now that you've now that you've fixed all these mistakes people are just going to read it and read it smoothly and not have to put in that kind of effort so yeah. you know so, so sometimes sometimes having a mistake put in front of you actually sharpens you rabbi yeah so can't you say that about the art scroll gemar it, yes there are many people that that are that are very, very much against the art scroll gemara. There's some yeshivas that refuse to allow their uh, refuse to allow their students to have an art scroll gemara because what happens is that the people's minds um, don't become sharpened because they've got everything laid out in front of them. But if a student has to break his head to try and figure out the gemara, that's going to sharpen his mind and it's going to cause him to uh, to to be able to better understand the gemara on his own. However. On the other hand, you know, the other team will turn around and say, but you've at least opened up the ability for people to study the Gemara, right? Who otherwise would not have opened the book. So we have to say that in some contexts, it's okay. And in other contexts, it's not okay. So if you have a, a child who's studying in yeshiva all day, and he has the time to work hard to try and understand the Gemara, then for him, it's not a good idea to use the art scroll. But if you have somebody who's a businessman or somebody who is not going to um, open up the Gemara because he doesn't have the resources available to him to be able to understand the Gemara, then for him, learning from the art scroll is definitely, infinitely better than not learning at all. Okay. So now we have time for one more. Right. So he says like this, certain man went down to lead the prayers before of Hanina. And he, in his prayers, said, the great, the mighty, the awesome, the glorious, the strong, and the powerful. After which, Hanina says to him, no, so did you, did you conclude all the praises of your master? In other words, by adding those extra phrases that you added, which is beyond what the what the rabbis of the Anshik and law put to um, establish as what we should praise Hashem within the Amidah, now that you've added these things, have you finished all the praises of Hashem? Now, regarding those three, Hakel, Hagodil, Hagiba, Vahanoira, right? So, Hagodil, Hagiba, Vahanoira, if not for the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu um, had written them, then, and Anshik Hanos Sagdela established them as being part of our prayers, we would not recite those prayers either. And now you're saying all of these, all of these extra prayers. This is like somebody who comes along to somebody who has thousands and thousands of gold dinners and starting to praise him by, say, by, by saying that he has silver dinners. Isn't that a disgrace to him? And so therefore, therefore, he, what he was rebuking him is to say, listen, just stick with 
what the Anchekne Sagdela established as the praise we should give Hashem, and then you'll be safe. Because once you start uh, adding your own, what you're really doing is you're not adding, you're diminishing the greatness of Hashem by limiting it to the the different phrases uh, of praise that you're going to use. And it will stop here. I wish you all a wonderful Shabbos, and we will see you as Hashem on Sunday. Thank you, Thank Rabbi, you. and everybody. Thank you. No problem.